another brother duo unable to reconcile their differences were the Monroes. They only sang together for a few years, splitting in 1938. But the breakup meant that the younger brother, Bill Monroe, would go it alone and become legendary as the father of bluegrass. It's uh, hard to imagine what American music would sound like today without the influence of Bill Monroe. How about a great big welcome for the old boy from Kentucky, Bill Monroe. Not only was Monroe was not a sappy country singer, he didn't sing these beautiful love songs, you know, tender. He was, you know, he was just a hard driving, you know, aggressive in your face with an attitude type player. Was Bill Monroe an unbelievable musician? He took a little small instrument like a mandolin and made uh, made a music basically out of, out of it. He called his band the Bluegrass Boys after his home state of Kentucky. He'd handpicked each of his musicians and seemed to be on a mission to create a new sound. Uh, he was never especially forthcoming about what he was trying to do with his music. Uh, he was moody. Uh, he was a sort of mystery wrapped in an enigma, as somebody once said. Uh, but he was also an absolute creative genius. Monroe's musical blend was constantly evolving, but it was only in 1945 when Earl Scruggs, a young banjo player from North Carolina, joined the mix, that the actual bluegrass sound began to be defined. He'd been searching for a sound that he could really call his own. And uh, I think when he heard Earl Scruggs play the banjo, I think it was like a light went off in his head and he said, that's, that's what I've been missing, that's what I've been waiting for, is that, that banjo sound that is just, that's gonna revolutionize banjo playing. banjo players from the opera said well when, when he heard Earl Scruggs play the banjo he said well I'm just gonna take my banjo home and make a hen's nest out of it you know <laughs> Bluegrass, uh, when first I first came here, this style of banjo that I play had never been exposed before. And I came here with Bill Monroe, and uh, that's where the, the sound, I guess, probably originated. And of course, everywhere I went, I had to take it with me because that's all I know is what I play. Monroe could not have invented bluegrass music without the help of Earl Scruggs. A lot of people today even say that bluegrass isn't bluegrass if it doesn't have a Scruggs-style banjo in it. The banjo styles that were really more prevalent during the time before Dad came there, a lot of times it might be uh, someone that was sort of like a comedian's instrument. Um, and again, it wasn't really so much of a lead instrument as it became once Dad introduced this new style. It used to be what they call two-fingered, which is actually a little misleading. It was thumb and one finger. Then when I was about 10 years old, I came up with a style that had a, the two fingers and thumb, which is called three-finger style. I mean, Kind of before Earl Scruggs put the banjo and the drive and that whole real familiar tag to it, you know, it wasn't that much different from from mountain music and string band music and whatnot, but just the, the element of 
Monroe's chopping mandolin and Earl Scruggs is driving banjo, it really then had something that you could define and say, this is what it is. This was bluegrass, and it was to take the country music world by storm. Sometimes people think that musical change takes a while, uh, but in this case, it was instantaneous. Overnight, everybody wanted to hear the Scruggs-style banjo. But Earl Scruggs would only play with Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys for two and a half years before leaving with guitarist and singer Lester Flatt. For all they'd added to Bill Monroe's sound, their parting from his band had been less than amicable. Bill Monroe is what some people would call a hard case. If you played in his band, you were expected to, to do farm work uh, in the off, you know, the, the off-road moments. Monroe's disciplinarian ways were too much for many musicians, and few stayed with him for long. More people work for Bill Monroe than has ever worked for, I'll say, two dozen country bands, because he had a new person every week, just about. It. And uh, sometimes they'd only last one week, and then he'd have another new one next, uh, next time. And all the musicians, which has been thousands of them, that worked for Bill Monroe, they would quit and go out and start their own. Say, well, what kind of music we couldn't do? We can't call our group Bluegrass Boys, but we can do bluegrass music the same as Bill's Boys does. He was notorious also till the last years of his life for being sort of the chief of police of bluegrass authenticity. If Monroe heard music that purported to be bluegrass, but which he thought was not up to the mark, he would say, that ain't no part of nothing. had its heyday in the late 40s, but the 50s saw rapid social change and a swift evolution of the music scene in the wake of rock and roll. To compete, country music lost some of its hillbilly soul and went electric. Bluegrass became the music industry's term for the old-fashioned stuff. Country music really suffered, and especially, you know, bluegrass groups like the Stanley Brothers and Flatt and Scruggs and Bill Monroe. They went from probably, you know, thousand dollars a day which was a lot of money back in those days to maybe if they could get you know 100 bucks 150 dollars a night but as the 50s turned to the 60s this perception of bluegrass as non-commercial ironically started the music on the road to revival it was starting to get the attention of uh, another whole group of people in the marketplace and a real young audience reacting against the superficiality of consumerism and concerned with the country's political direction, a new generation of Americans sought a pure music closer to the country's folk roots. Bluegrass artists like Flat and Scruggs found themselves on a whole new trip. It came at a time when there were a lot of things happening in the country, and a lot of the songs, folk music songs, reflected that, as did earlier folk music songs that talked about hard times, you know, real life sort of situations, and, and the music just reflected that. The bluegrass is, is about authenticity, and it, it, or a cry for authenticity, because uh, authenticity only becomes an issue when you don't have it. People rediscovered the old songs, and with them the old singers. Ralph Stanley's Man of Constant Sorrow touched a nerve in the American psyche once more. I love it 
A.P. Carter did not live long enough to see this renaissance of his type of music, but Mabel had continued performing with her daughters, and even Sarah Carter was occasionally persuaded to make an appearance. The new lease of life given to bluegrass ensured the music would be inherited by a new generation. Come back over here just a minute. Let, let's tell all these folks your name. You want to tell them? All right. My name's Ricky Scrag. Ricky Scrag. And you're how old? Seven years old. Seven years old. My father bought me a mandolin when I was f uh, five years old. Showed me three chords, you know, and here are the the little mill bass chords, G, C, and D. <laughs> Most of